can you keep up with the pace of market regulatory reform? MarketsReformWiki.com, the place to keep up. What is the interdealer broker market? The interdealer broker market um, goes back probably about 100 years or so. Uh, the, the roots of them uh, really began in London, in the foreign exchange markets, and they, they truly were that. They were, they were neutral intermediaries between large banks. Um, in the States, uh, probably in the, um, in the early 70s, the interdealer market um, blossomed in the U.S. Treasury market. Um, U.S. Treasuries were a, quote, obligation market. So if you're a primary dealer, you were obliged to, quote, another primary dealer, uh, a two-sided market for Treasuries. That's a pretty inefficient way to find out where something's priced, right? Um, but the reality was it was an executable quote, and it was two-sided. Uh, so the interdealer market uh, grew out of that. And at one point, there were eight or nine different U.S. Treasury interdealer brokers. Um, technology consolidation, you know, we're down to five major interdealer brokers. The exchanges operate, you know, pits, trading pits, right? And, and in those pits, they have traders and brokers standing alongside each other. Traders that have a vested interest if the market goes up or down, and brokers that only have an interest that the market goes up or down, right? Um, we don't have traders on our broking floor. We have brokers. Uh, we don't we don't take an interest in, in the direction of the market. We only take an interest in the fairness and transparency of the market. What is the relationship between IDBs, CEFs, and the Dodd-Frank Act? What I personally found rewarding about the Dodd-Frank process was that what came out of that process was this notion of competitive neutral intermediaries. Um, they became called CEFs, Swap Execution Facilities. And uh, the interdealer broker business was really the model for that, right? Um, you know, CEFs don't, um, don't list swaps. They make them available to trade. There's a different concept there. Interdealer brokers don't list anything, right? When a customer says, find me a market, find me a bid, we go to work. We compete to do that. Time is of the essence in our ability to what we do. How has the CEFCON narrative evolved since the first meeting in 2010? Let's go through the brief three-year history of CEFCONs, right? Uh, CEFCON 1 was the world's changing with what's going to happen, how do we prepare for it? CEFCON 2 was, hey, it's a year later, all the rules are supposed to be done, the rules aren't done yet. CEFCON 3 is, hey, it's two years later, the rules still aren't finalized. Uh, so one of the messages we hope to get out today was we, we need these rules to be finalized, right? We need to, we need to move on. Um, but, but certain things have happened in the last few months that have... Um, have reinforced what we thought might happen. Um, the Department of Justice, back in 2008, um, issued a report on the anti-competitive nature of single silo futures markets, and uh, made a point to the regulators to say, this is anti-competitive, there's, there's something to look at here. Um, with the recent migration of the energy markets from swaps to futures, um, well, one of those three legs got shortened, the swaps leg, uh, but not only that, um, now we're concentrating risk further into a single clearinghouse where the energy swaps market had a couple of places to clear swaps. Uh, the energy futures market, these aren't fungible contracts. Um, so I think the risk that you run is you've concentrated risk uh, more so than, than necessary. Um, you've taken away choice to some extent. Um, you know, if you're worried about putting all your money in one bank, you can go to a couple of different banks. If you're worried about putting all your money in one clearinghouse, you should be able to go to a few clearinghouses. Uh, that choice has been taken away. So I think that's one of the things that we're hearing today at CEFCON 3 is, um, you know, the, the futuration, futurization of the swaps market. Did that, did that really happen? Does it have an impact? Does it matter? And I think the message we're hearing is that it does matter. How are IDBs affected by the costs associated with transferring to an electronic market? Cost is a real concern. Um, you know, a company like ICAP that has the resources, you know, can do things like this. Um, but again, it, it, it's not an insignificant cost, even for a company like ICAP. Um, 
you know, when you look at the DCMs, the DCMs operate single silo marketplaces. You can't you can't trade a uh, an ICE contract on the CMA and clear it at the CMA. It goes back to ICE. <laughs> um, so so when you're when you're building your DCM and you get your approval for this contract, you know you've got this um, this monopoly being built in, cooked in to the DCM marketplace. Um, we operate fungible products, so we compete for the execution of those products. We don't have the luxury of saying you can only buy or sell to your notes at ICAP. Um, so cost is clearly a concern. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, on the technology side, many of our systems are built already. Um, tweaking the systems to meet the regulatory needs is something we do on a regular basis. What is the future of voice broking? The market participants will choose electronic trading when, when it's right. Um, we have significant capabilities for central and order books. Um, we have, uh, as ICAP as a company, has higher margins on electronic trading than on voice trading. Um, but it, it's not a one-size-fits-all marketplace. The market understood that there was a, a role for the voice broker. Um, it was never, we don't operate in a, in a bilateral world. We operate in a multilateral world, right? Our business is to broadcast prices in an effort to execute trades. Um, why is that important? Well, in a marketplace that has five or 6,000 trades all day across the entire gamut of swaps, you don't have this continuous liquidity, this continuous pricing. So you have very tentative markets, right? Having said that, you can do very large trades by capturing liquidity at a point. So that, that negotiated process of, hey, I found the buyer for 50, I wonder if I can do 250. And that's that negotiated process that, that comes into play. So voice, I think voice will always have a role, um, but I do think it, uh, it will, a lot of that will depend on how the rules finally come out.